Welcome to Community Voices with Carly Lissa Thorne. And I have with me today Dr. Carletta D. Washington. And we're going to be talking all about education today. So welcome, Carletta. Hi, thank you for having me on your show today. I'm really excited to have you back once again because we had technical <laughs> issues yesterday. Yay! <laughs> I love it when we get to re-record. But anyways, I am real excited to have you back because we you just have a plethora of information for people out there. So first I'd like to start with, what was your inspiration behind starting your foundation? Okay, so for starting my foundation, uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit education organization. It's entitled Education for All. And I've been working in education now for 20 years previously in the K through 12 public school system as either a teacher or an administrator and now recently I'm working as an as a consultant so when I started education for all in 2002 that was based on my experiences with parents and my colleagues and students and just all those issues that surrounded education where schools were starting to fail by leaps and bounds uh, communities were deteriora deteriorating because the schools were deteriorating. Um, also, the future outlook for students of that generation at that time, it just didn't, it just looked bleak. So I wanted to be a person who helped to put together uh, a strategy that would allow parents, students, educators, and communities to work together. So that's why I have four in the name Education for All because those are the four key stakeholders that we need in order to help education at the grassroots level. So my goal is, uh, at the time that I started this, was just basically for everybody to see that if they work together and just do little things, even at the grassroots level, that we could improve education. So wouldn't you say that collaboration is very important? Yes, it is. It's extremely important. You also said there were four key components. So what are those four key components? Okay, so students, parents, schools, and communities. And we need to make sure that all of those entities are being held accountable. They're holding themselves accountable and they're holding each other accountable. And that each person is just doing what they can on their part. So it may not be anything huge, but just every little thing that each of those four groups can do on their own that, and in collaboration with each other, then I believe that that can help education improve. Okay, now I also know you're uh, uh, actually quite the writer because you've written three books. And I know each of those books have an amazing, just, uh, uh, quite the, you know, <laughs> my point is each one of those books has a section pertaining to actually one of those keys, if you will. Yes. So let's actually go through each one of those books because okay. each one of those books has a lot of content in there that has so many rich tools for parents, students, right. and also teachers. So let's uh -huh. start with your first book, give the title, and then give a synopsis, if you will, of what is in that book to give okay. tips and tools to the community. Okay. Well, first of all, I love writing. I've always loved writing. English was my best subject in uh, from grade school through high school. I even was teaching English when I was a teacher, and uh, my students did an awful lot of writing. So for me, writing comes naturally, and I know a lot of people have trouble getting started, and they ask, well, how can I write a book, or how did you do it, or I would love to write a book, but I just can't see myself doing it. So I encourage people, if they just spend 15 minutes every night, start out small, you know, then you build your way up to maybe an hour, two hours, four hours, whatever your limit is, you know, that you want to invest in it. So that's what I did, you know, with each of my books. I just set aside a certain amount of time or I decided, well, you know, let me get to a certain amount of chapters, one chapter, two chapters, etc. So for me, writing is fun. And it's also therapeutic because my books are a little bit autobiographical in nature in that some of the things relate to me and some of it relate to others and what I've seen work with them. And um, also with the books, I've focused on education, parenting, and entrepreneurship. So I have three. And this first book, which is called 
education reform, the role and responsibility of schools, parents, students, and communities. This one was written in 2006. And this book has four sections to it, which goes back to my four key components are the four stakeholders when it comes to education, students, parents, schools, and communities. So with each section, um, what I'm looking for is particularly for parents to get the book because it's not written in education jargon. It's basic language that we all can understand so it's not educators speak with our alphabet soup of IEP and uh, PLC and, and all the, the little acronyms and terms that we use as education professionals. It's just down to earth language and it's broken down simply for parents to understand what it is that they should be looking for in the education system. So with parents, if they read this book, they can get a comprehensive view of what education should look like. Um, so for instance, in the parent section, I talk about um, finding a daycare or a preschool for their child. So the difference between daycare and preschool, there's a huge difference. Preschool actually prepares kids for school. And with today's standards, states are moving away from regular state standards into the common core standards, which are supposed to be like national standards across the, across the United States. And so the curriculum is testing kids younger and younger. Uh, one of our districts, Francis Howell School District here in St. Louis, Missouri, um, they are actually preparing their preschoolers to write words and to string together sentences and to work on their spelling. So their spelling and their reading and writing skills are much more elevated um, for their kindergartners than they ever have been in the past. And mainly because if a student is judged and a school is judged on third grade test scores, you have to prepare the students earlier. And because all students may not go to preschool, the kindergarten teacher has an awful lot to do in terms of bringing those students who may not be up to par, bringing them up to par, and then trying to also keep those who are on par and beyond, keep them excited so that they don't lose them before kindergarten is even over because they're bored. So kindergarten teachers, hats off, they have a huge burden on their shoulders. But there's a difference in preschool and daycare. So I encourage parents, you know, work with babysitters and daycare. But once your child hits two and a half, they're potty trained or they're three, and the uh, preschool will accept them, send your child to preschool. And I also talk about what to look for. You know, does the school provide a routine? Will they give you a daily report card? You know, because you want to know, did your child have a good day? Did they go to the bathroom? You know, um, it's important for us to flush out our systems. And some schools, I know my daughter's preschool when she was young, she's 23 now, but they would let us know if she had a bowel movement, you know, because that's important. You know, we talk about our bodies being toxic and holding in all this waste. And with our little ones, we don't tend to think about that as much, but they can get. Um, you know, irritable bowel syndrome and, and other things just like adults do, other types of uh, gastrointestinal uh, issues and concerns. So in your school, you know, did the preschool tell you, does your child go to the bathroom on a regular basis? Did they have a bowel movement? Did they eat all their food? What did they learn today? You know, what's the schedule? Um, when we visited, my husband and I, when we visited preschools for our daughter, we found that some of them had the word play on the schedule. It was just riddled with play, play, play. And I didn't care how they termed it, kinetic, kinesthetic, this, that. You know, it was play to me. So I wanted to know when was she actually writing and reading. And so look to see what the preschool schedule is like. Is it varied? You know, if when they get there, they're playing, then they're maybe learning one or two letters, then they're playing, then they eat lunch, then they play. I mean, you may want to stray away from that school because your child won't necessarily be prepared for kindergarten. And again, if your child is in a district like Francis Howe, they will need to be prepared for kindergarten. Um, also, I talk about discipline. 
I talk about building a relationship with your child's school. So those are just some sections for parents that I provide quick, easy tips for them to do. And then for students, I talk a lot about respect. You know, particularly if a student is respecting himself, others, uh, other adults, and the peers, you know, then the education learning environment can flow so much smoothly if the kids are being respectful. And I know you and I, Carly, had talked before about parents needing to teach the kids respect at home. That is first and foremost. You know, so parents have to do their jobs. You can't just send them to school and expect that your kids know how to behave or will learn how to behave or it's the school's job to teach them. It's your job first and the school's job second. And um, so if the kids are respectful, there's less discipline, there's more learning, there are uh, more opportunities for kids to be successful and to do some of the fun things. You know, sometimes the fun things are cut out in certain schools where kids are failing because they are failing and the school has to be um, on point and keeping up with raising the student's test score. So they kind of cut out field trips or they cut out award ceremonies and things like that because the lack of respect for the teachers in a learning environment has surpassed the respect for learning. So that's a big thing I focus on with students. So if parents are reading that section, they know. Talk to your kids about respect because that plays an intricate part in education. Then there's a section for schools. And what I'm looking for in there is I'm suggesting to schools make sure that you're getting professional development for your teachers. Make sure that they are trained. Make sure that they understand what it is that they're being trained on. You know, we can get all this training, but if we don't understand how to actually apply it once we leave, kind of like for me, for me with math, you know, English was my best subject, as I said, so math was not necessarily my best. I loved it, just wasn't that good at it, so I understood it while I was there, but when I left and went home, everything about math just escaped me. So that's the same thing with teachers sometimes. You know, they learn a lot, they have a lot going on, they make a thousand and one decisions every day, every hour of the day. So just making sure that there's follow-up for them to be sure that they're understanding what it is they're supposed to implement and how to implement it appropriately. And then also lesson plans. You know, um, my best days were when my lesson plans were well, well developed. You know, I could tell if I didn't put, put my all or do my best with the lesson plan, it was a pretty good indicator of how the class was going to go. So, I mean, some people can pull it off better than most, you know, better than others, and I was one of those. But at the same time, the lessons that I really prepared for, I had so much fun, and I saw the kids learning so much. So I encourage my colleagues to make sure that they're giving all that they can in their lessons. And I know their days are filled with a lot of things. Some of them are going back to school because you have to return to school and get so much training to keep your certification. And then some of them have families. Um, some of them are required to do after school duty. So there's so much in an educator's life that they can become consumed and overwhelmed just by the workload alone. But I encourage them to put those lesson plans first because it will take care of some of their stress. Um, so for a parent reading their, the school section, they will know, well, you know, there's a lesson plan. So let me go ask the teacher, may I see your lesson plan? That's a good way for them to check behind their student who says, so-and-so doesn't give any homework. You know, well, <laughs> you looked at the teacher's lesson plan, so you knew that there was homework. You knew that there was a quiz or a test. And today, since the book has been written, it was in 2006, but today and in recent years, Schools have uh, gone to electronic grading. So parents, there is no excuse why you should never know your child's grade or, what, or their attendance or who their teachers are or uh, their behavior because a lot of that is recorded by pretty much every single district online. I know one is a uh, power school and I can't think of the others off the top of my head but a lot of districts use Power School here in St. Louis, Missouri, and there are other programs you just have to check with your school to see what they're using. 
and all they all you need is just the password and you can go on and pull everything up I was uh, supposed to tutor a student once but there were some other issues with the family so tutoring kind of was like the last thing there was really counseling and other things that the family needed uh, and then I think tutoring would have been fine after that so we agreed as a team that tutoring was not going to be the first step or should not be the first step so um, this student kept saying he didn't have any homework he didn't know when they were going to have quizzes and tests well, as soon as his um, mom's fiance said well you know we've got everything online here let me pull up his grades for you I was able to show the student here's a pattern from your English teacher alone <laughs> every three tests the, every three chapters in this book there is a quiz or a test I said this test here said chapters one through three this was said four through seven so I said that's heads up you know look for the patterns so I said so you did have homework he may not have said specifically read these chapters in advance but you now know his patterns so guess what go back and read those chapters you know and read ahead so I was able to help him to understand like the light bulb went off <laughs> that there is homework being given whether it's it said directly or indirectly you can learn a lot from that I also came in, counter, uh, in contact with a parent whose son was ready to graduate and a lot of times we see parents who have seniors and they sit back and they think that their kids are going to do all well so they can graduate no you know I tell kids graduation is for your parents I can promise you if it looks like you don't graduate see how fast your parents come up if they've never visited school in your life see how fast they come up if they think that you're not going to graduate so there's one parent I've witnessed her I was out in public location and I witnessed her just really upset when she got off the phone that um, her son's teacher had called her and let her know that there was some work that he was missing well graduation was about uh, six weeks I think six to eight weeks away mom called him so quickly and it was not a good conversation but I overheard part of the conversation that she could check power school so you know parents don't wait until the last minute and track your seniors you know track your freshmen track your uh, middle schoolers those are grades where you really have to be up on top of because we think they're independent and they're mature and they're going to do what they want to do no they're um, not mature enough all of them to handle that much freedom and flexibility and responsibility so parents reading that you know these sections it gives them a comprehensive viewpoint and then the final section of this particular book is dealing with communities you know often we have communities where kids are failing the district is failing they may have an older population of um, people who are retired and people who don't have any kids or any grandkids still in the area they've paid off their home and sometimes this group of individuals feel like well you know I really don't care what happens you know my kids are grown or they went to private school or you know it doesn't relate to me but I encourage that group to, vi to visit schools, adopt schools, volunteer at schools, go to board me meetings, find out what the school needs because when that school goes down your property value goes down and you may want to sell your house but a family who's moving in will say well you know the school district's kinda bad you know I don't think that I want to buy a house here kinda like the um, I think it's the Zillow commercial with the dad the military dad and the mom is all excited his wife is excited oh I love the school he says "Hun, did you see the school rating and she looks and it says a three I think at three out of five and her, her heart you can just see her heart drop so you know there are houses that parents want but if the school district isn't doing well they're not going to buy your house they're not even going to rent your house in fact so um, you know I encourage people to stay involved with the districts and also think about you may not have you may not be the one selling your house sometimes if you're older you can get sick you can um, need to move in with your kids go to a nursing home retirement home because of your fixed income 
So then it becomes a burden on your kids. Well, what do we do with this house that nobody wants? You know, we can't even rent it. So the house goes down, it's broken into, it becomes vandalized property. I mean, there's a host of things that can go wrong simply because the older population doesn't feel a need to be committed to the school system. So if they're reading it as a parent, this book, they will know, well, let me get these retirees involved. <laughs> you know, I need them to help my child to be successful because one day I'll be a retiree or I'll be an elderly person and I'll want somebody, you know, to help me out or, you know, things like that. So this first book is really comprehensive. It's short, though. It's a short read, even though it's packed with a punch. <laughs> so it's something that I feel like parents would walk away saying, okay, now I better understand the education system and why didn't people take the time to explain it to me this simply and to show me how it all fits. So, so that's the first book. You bring up some really valid points. I think a lot of people, once their kids are grown, they totally forget about the school system. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, you know, that I've, I've, do, I've done my dues, I've paid my dues, you know, my kids have gone through school, blah, 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 I don't need to be involved anymore. I think, and I think it's really important that, you know, we do stay involved, we do stay involved with our community because right. it helps everybody in the process. I do want to bring one more thing um, mm -hmm. between uh, daycares and preschools. Um, there are some daycares that, do teach. So when you're looking at you know preschools and daycares, you know because obviously you can't get to preschool to a certain age, go vet or look at the daycares because there are some daycares that have gotten smart and realized that you know mm -hmm. just throwing them in front of a TV or babysitting them isn't serving the children. So there are some daycares that have actually um, gone on to you know treat it as a preschool. Um, and I know because um, way back in the 80s, I actually ran, I was certified through New York State as, you know, when you, you become a, uh, uh, what they call a... A oh, licensed care provider, I, something like I that. ran my center, it was called Learning, Playing, and Growing Incorporated, and I mm -hmm. ran it as a preschool. It was, it was a daycare, certified, you know, family daycare center, but I ran it as a preschool. And, and I did exactly what you're talking about. I had a book, every child had a, had a notebook. And, and every day the parents got a report card as to exactly what was going on every day. They went to, you know, the library every week for story hour. I mean, wow. exactly what you're talking about. Every single kid that left me before they went to kindergarten, or, you know, or, or you know, were reading and writing. So there mm -hmm. are there are family day there are family daycare certified providers. Um, they're certified by each individual state. Um, right. Group certified daycare providers that do run them as preschools. Um, so, so go look because there are right. some that are being smart and realizing that you know they're serving their children better by teaching them. Um, mm -hmm. So, because I totally agree with you, um, throwing in front of a TV or looking for a daycare center that just babysit is not serving right. their children. Um, and so, yes, absolutely, preschools are 100% better. I just know that there are a lot of them out there that do do more. So um, look, don't just you know, uh, just just because it's a daycare that that's that's all they are. So right. so before they enter another you know preschool, obviously they need to go somewhere. So right. go check out the smaller ones. I'm not talking about the large daycares because they don't do that because they can't. Right. They just yeah. don't have the facilities to do that. They usually they usually are just babysitting services. But if you look at the smaller family certified, state certified mm -hmm. homes type of situations, a lot of them aren't run like that. So go look. And that's an excellent point. Thank you for clarifying that. It is the larger centers where you won't see a lot of that going on. But like you said, the family owned, the smaller ones, definitely it's there in a lot of those. And that's what we have for our daughter when she was younger. Um, I wanted, even though she was young, you know, I still wanted to know what else, what will she be doing besides taking a nap, you know, because that tends to happen a lot, nap time, you know, or snack time, or TV time, you know, or free play, so, yeah, definitely when she was in, in uh, daycare, well, she had a babysitter, we, it, it was a babysitter, but she still ran it like, it was a preschool, so that that's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, so obviously we had those times. We did have nap time. We had story time, but we had writing. Right. We had 
um, math time. We had we ran it as a preschool, so they have they had music time, they had art mm -hmm. time, they had you know, they had all those sections, and of course they had play time, and they had they right. did have a small amount of TV time, but it wasn't typical TV time. It was right. everything they wrote was everything they they watched was educational. Educational, right? Exactly. So. Um, I had a minivan, and we went to museums, and we went here, and we went there. So yeah, it was really run as you know, and it was it was incorporated. So you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was called Learning, Playing, and Growing Incorporated. So I really wow. ran it as a preschool, um, and we had a curriculum, and they got report cards and all that stuff. So you know, just look for places that are smaller because then they can. Right. Do and I actually had another staff member, so it wasn't just me, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, it, you know, I never had more than I think we had up to I think it was twelve kids because you only have so many, and it had to be so yeah. many. Usually, like ten to twelve. Yeah, exactly. And I had a couple after schoolers. But anyway, mm -hmm. my point is, so so look for that. Look for people right. that know what they're doing, that are educated, that have you know these particular things in mind. But anyways, so that's just a sidebar. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so that was just something I just wanted to bring up. But you yeah, had the second book. This is the second one. May not be able to see it too well with the lighting, but this one is called A Mother's Reflection Protecting Your Child from Harmful Images or Harmful Influences. And this book was written in 2010. So this is my second book. And this one is based on our experience with our daughter during those teen years, those tough teen years when you're trying to um, just, well, when your teen is trying to really assert their independence. And uh, so for us, we had other adults that were interfering and actually undermining our parental authority with our child by wanting to be her friend and make us seem like we were just the mean folks, you know. Um, there was no fun to be had in our uh, home. And so uh, what I'm encouraging parents to do is to look for signs. You know, when they see signs of things where people are undermining their authority, you know, stand up, speak out about it, uh, don't hesitate, don't sweep it under the rug and things like that. So, for instance, uh, when our daughter was little and she would ride her little tricycle when she was real young, um, we, she only could go between like two two houses to the right and two houses to the left. You know, we were outside, but just so she could feel independent, two and two, you know, that was enough. Turn around <laughs> and then go the other direction. Or if she rode further, we needed to be with her. So as she got older, she could go on the block. She could go from one end to the other end. If she was going further, we had to be with her. And so there was this family that had moved in, two families. They were um, newer in the neighborhood than we were. And one of them had a boy and another had a boy and a girl. Well, one of them um, who had the little girl, her daughter was, I guess, about four years younger than my daughter. So they were all pretty young. She was still like, I guess her daughter was probably about like a preschooler. And so anyway, the mom said, well, she tried to get the other mom involved. She said, well, you know, how come you don't let her come out? You know, let her come outside sometime, you know, and, and ride her bike, you know, through the neighborhood. And, you know, I just kind of looked at her because my daughter was in dance. Uh, we did things at church. We did things with family. We'd have family over. So I just wanted to, I felt like at that time, maybe if you found something for your child to do other than just hang outside, you know, then you wouldn't worry about what we're doing with our child. So basically, she was just saying she never saw her. Well, we were always busy. You know, I had more than enough for her to do so that just hanging out was not an option, you know, for her. That was something where after we took a break from the other activities, yeah, you can hang out for a little bit, but not just all day. So that was kind of one thing, you know, and I didn't say a whole lot about it, but later that relationship uh, even though I allowed my daughter to continue playing with them, it still just kind of, um, you know, undermined our authority at different times. So if I asked her to come home at a certain time, she'd come home late. Then the mom would come and say, well, it's my fault. You know, and you just, that's just not an acceptable excuse. You know, as parents, we have to think about when our child gets to be a teenager and they're driving, they're dating, and you ask them to come home at a certain time, 
you know, what excuse will you accept? You know, so I try to let that parent know that this is unacceptable in our household because if we give a time, and it's especially if it's a agreed upon time, it's beyond the time. It's about um, being trustworthy. It's about it's being able to keep commitments, time commitments, or balancing your time. So just all of those skills that we were trying to teach her so she can be a well-rounded person, this other parent just had no regard for. You know? And then we talk about um, other relatives who in the family were undermining our authority with different things, you know, letting her sneak and use their cell phone to call certain people or uh, watch certain TV shows that, though they were fine, they were fine for adults, but not necessarily for kids, you know, even if they were teenagers. So just a couple of things like that, you know, and it's actually a journal and it's written for parents, whether you're a mom or a dad, it really doesn't matter, or you're a grandparent or uncle who's having to care for a kid. Um, I want them to read it and to answer questions, to think about things. You know, so there's my story, which I try to keep very short and brief, and it's not tabloid. So for those who look for juiciness, you know, it's, it's a page turner. I've been told it's a page turner, but... Um, <laughs> I try to protect everyone, even though I felt like people infringed upon me and our uh, parental authority. But that's not the goal of the book. I wanted the book to be therapeutic for me, as I wrote it really was. But then also I wanted it to be a help guide for parents. You know, this is what you can look for. This is how you can handle some things. So here's my story. Now here's a reflection question. And then now you answer and talk about how you're going to approach this. One of the things is fashion. And we know with fashion, you know, for the girls in particular, these designers are designing as if they're making things for grown women. You know, and there are some things that several of us grown women wouldn't wear. You know, we talk about the Daisy Dukes. And I remember walking in the store when my daughter was only about four and that's the first thing this this uh, young sales girl showed us, and I said, uh, I wouldn't wear that, you know. And I'm in my 20s. I know I'm not gonna put that on my daughter and think that's cute. And then also, when our daughter was growing up, the shoe size so as her foot got bigger, then the heels got taller, and we had I, that was one of our battles, you know. It couldn't be couldn't get into the stilettos. You know, I talked about all kinds of health issues and just waiting, you know, prolong some of those things. Don't put your body through all of that or have people look at you in a certain way and you're really not ready to handle those types of consequences that come with that. So if people think you're grown because you're, well, if you're dressing like you're a grown woman, people are going to treat you that way and look at you that way and then they're going to have certain expectations which aren't so polite, you know, so fashion was an issue. But I also, in the book, I asked parents, think about what your fashion was like when you were growing up, you know, because some of the parents, they may have wanted to wear heels earlier. They may have worn their shirts tied up to the chest or, you know, or things like that or cheek shorts or whatever they want to call it or cutouts, but, and their parents didn't necessarily approve. So I try to get parents to think about how did your parents deal with these issues, you know, some of them, you know, how did your parents deal with these issues with you, and then how can you relate that to your kids, and how can you have a happy medium and a balance so that fashion is not one of those things that tears you apart. So um, fashion, friends, internet, cell phones, uh, <laughs> TV, movies, neighbors, family members, all of those are some of the things that I talk about in the book in terms of harmful influences, you know, and sometimes we think uh, right away drugs, it doesn't have to be drugs, you know, drugs, alcohol is not our concern, you know, but there are other things that appear to be innocent, but parents really need to see, you know, how those things that appear to be innocent could be sabotaging them uh, and their authority with and their relationship with their kids indirectly. And just quickly, um, our relationship with our daughter, once she hit, I guess about maybe 18 and a half, and she's 23 now, 
it has become more and more solid and she's now understanding the things that we were doing and trying to do and trying to teach her and she really has expressed appreciation you know my husband would ask I wonder if she thinks you know if she uh, appreciates anything that we did or does she really love us you know today and I'll tell him if you read those Mother's Day and Father's Day cards and the birthday cards there is some serious thought in those cards she doesn't get us generic cards that just say happy birthday happy Mother's Day happy Father's Day they sound as if she could have written those herself they're beautiful they're on point they talk about forgiveness they talk about building relationships even deeper so just um, you know I know that now we have a really good relationship and I just encourage parents to stand their ground. You know, don't be your child's friend and think that you'll, don't be so scared to lose them. You know, um, if you lose your child for a little while, it's like the prodigal son, they come back home. You know, if you train your child up in the way that they go when they're older, they won't depart from it and they'll be back home because they know that you love them after they see what life has been like out from underneath your wings of protection. So that's the second book. And again, you bring up a lot of uh, really great tips because we, we are so afraid. A lot of parents want to just be friends with their kids. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think, yes, there's a part of it where you are friends with your children. However, there's also the part where if, if you don't set some boundaries and if you're not their parent, there is that right. point where you know kids do, they look for those boundaries. They look for mm -hmm. that kind of divide between parent and child and because they need that so um, there's there really is that fine balance between the two and 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 that respect um, I find that when you see when you see the parents that are just strictly friends with their kids it's so confusing and they don't yeah. know and they don't really know, even know how to um, necessarily go to the parents sometimes for things because is it is this my friend or is this my parent? Right. Am I gonna get the kind of advice or that I need? Um, and I don't know. There's this kind of confusion. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a place where you you know there's that blend where yes you can be a, a, a you know that friend, but at the mm -hmm. same time there also has to be that thing. Okay, I'm also your parent. Um, mm -hmm. So and then, and then there are like you said all those things that you have to navigate with children. So those are really um, great things that you put in there. Um, and it isn't like you said. It isn't just the drugs or the alcohol. There's right. so, and everyone always thinks it's just the drugs and the alcohol. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's just like all those other things. Right. Because usually, like you said, everyone just addresses those two things, and it's like, well, wait a minute. What about all these other things? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's really great. And then also, as um, raising them as adults, uh, because you're still raising them because you're older than them, uh, but. Um, you're still not their friend, you know, so I encourage parents to still remain the parent. You know, it's a different type of relationship. Now, our daughter and I, we will get close with her. We'll share a little bit more than we shared with her when she was just a kid under uh, under 21. But, um, you know, it, it's so different, you know, and we still don't take on her problems. She's an adult. She needs to earn it. I mean, own her problems. So we, um, she and I, we will have this saying, and sometimes she'll just say it on her own. I guess I just need to put my big girl panties on. And I'm like, yes, you do, you know. And we laugh about it, and we talk and text, you know, several times each week. She's just about like two hours away from us, but you know, we're always in contact every week about something. And it's good news, you know, and sometimes I feel like I'm the first person she called about this. And other times she'll tell me, you know, I just really wanted to share this, you know. And I know she could have gotten her friends because with, with Twitter and Facebook and texting, you know, and Instagram, you know, you're able to get your friends sometimes a lot quicker than your parents. So especially those of us who aren't tech savvy. So, um, you know, I like that. A lot of times I'm the first person she turns to her. Even after she talks to her friends, she still contacts me and says, I really want to know what you think, you know. And so I, I appreciate that, you know. And so just parents, you know, make your kids grow up. Make them keep being responsible. You know, you don't 
raise them to keep them at home. You know, you don't raise them to be irresponsible because they need to be men and women of success, whatever that determination or a definition is for them. Also, they need to be prepared to be somebody's husband or wife, you know, and they need to be prepared to be some child's mother or father. So that's what, you know, I try to encourage parents to think about. Your kids aren't just your own, you know. Yes, you gave birth to them, but they're going out into a world to be many things, mothers, fathers, husbands, and wife. Hopefully husband and wife first, but husband, wife, mothers, fathers, uh, employees, employers, you know, there are just so many things that they're going out to do that being your son or daughter all their life, it's not the only thing that's going to be in their world. And that that was really pivotal to what you just said because I don't think a lot of people think that way. So that right. was really great. And you know that helps to alleviate some of that empty nest syndrome. You know we only had the one child, and when she entered high school, because I was teaching at a um, at a school at the time. Some of the staff said, boy, I remember when she was little and you used to bring her around here uh, because they remembered her at about, yeah, elementary level, from elementary to middle school. So they watched her grow up and they were like, well, what are you going to do? Because, you know, four years goes fast. And I said, well, I'm not raising her to keep her at home. You know, <laughs> I know she's going to leave at some point. I said, honestly, I want her to leave at some point. I don't want her to stay at home all her life, you know. So, um, and I knew my daughter wouldn't stay at home. I mean, she danced, she was part of a dance troupe, uh, and they had traveled. She was used to traveling as a dancer from probably about age four all the way up to about age 15. So, going throughout the United States, you know, when your kids travel, they're on the road through soccer teams, hockey, dance, baseball, football. Those are not kids that usually just want to take root and plant their feet even deeper where they come from. <laughs> you know, usually they want to get away because it's just in them. They're used to traveling. So I encourage parents, you know, to start letting their kids go the older they get. Think about them in terms of preparing them for the world because when your child does decide to leave, um, you will find that you can feel lonely and even depressed. You know, so I encourage parents, start getting you a hobby. If you let yourself go, if you stop bowling or playing on the sports league or whatever you used to, going out date nights with your spouse, start getting that back. So in that way, when your child is gone and they're just home for the holidays or home on leave or they're gone, period, you know, then you have a sense of self-worth. You know, your life isn't just tied to the kids because... I tell parents, you know, first was Adam and Eve and then the kids. You know, the kids weren't there, you know, and then the husband or the wife so or parents. So um, I want to encourage people also think about the empty nesters because they need a lot of support. Some of them aren't used to being by themselves. Some of them don't know how to parent adult children. That's another issue. You know, so those are some things that I think all of us can just look out for in our day-to-day -day situations. That's a really good point, too. Um, it is true. I think a lot of people know how to parent their little ones. Mm -hmm. And once they get to middle school, they're, again, very easy to parent. And then once they get to high school, they're like, I don't know what to do with my kids. They have no idea how to parent them once they get to high school. And then once they leave... And they, mm -hmm. you know, again, it becomes another foreign situation. They don't know how to parent once they've left. They're right. Like, what do I do with this situation? Do mm -hmm. I hug them? Do I kiss them? Do I call them? Do I not call them? Do I wait for them to call me? <laughs> Am I allowed to call them? What are the rules? <laughs> they get so confused as to what to do from there. Um, you know, because they want to give them their space. But mm -hmm. they them. So they're, you know, like they're really gray in their whole rules and, you know, what do I do? And, you know, a lot of that just comes from talking to your child because even with our daughter, when she was a teen and having those difficult times, um, I used to tell her, when you get to be an adult, I'm going to ask you three questions. Do you just need me to listen? Are you calling for money? 
or do you need my advice? You know, I said, beyond that, there's really nothing else I can say. You know, you're an adult at that point. So she see now that's how it is. You know, I'm not in her business. If she's married, they have a three-year-old. I am not trying to run their household. Uh, <laughs> when they come here, they've stayed here and you know they had the basement. We let the little the little ones stayed upstairs in the finished basement. But you know they had their privacy. They're married, you know, and and they're married adults. So you know it's there was just you could but you you know we could see the respect and I like that. You know they didn't run over us. You know I didn't have to remind her of anything. Basically I had always told her once she got grown and our relationship started rebuilding. The same rules that were here when she was a kid still apply now, you know. So I said, um, if you don't want to help walk the dog, you know, when you come over to visit, you may not want to stay, you know. Um, if you don't want to put your dish in the sink like you did when you were growing up, here may not be the place you want to be. I mean, so there were just basic things, you know, um, that we had. But we talked about it up front, you know, and, and I asked, do you think you can live with this? You know, so she already knew what our expectations were. And I think that's what's missing is that parents don't talk to their kids up front. And then when the situation happens, like I had a parent once his child was in college, um, he and his wife, of course, the rule was for him to take out the trash. Now, the son was staying at home in their home and going to college. But the dad couldn't figure out, do I tell him to take out the trash? I said, well, what has really changed? You know, he's still there. So, yes, ask him to keep taking out the trash unless you just really want to do it. No, I don't want to do the trash. And he was a funny guy. I love working with him. But, um, you know, so it's just talking to the kids and getting your comfort zone. You know, if there are things you don't mind doing, because they're an adult and they're just visiting or what have you, that's different. But if you know that there are some things that are just non-negotiable, then you really just have to tell the kids, you know, even though you're an adult, when you come by, you know, I prefer this, or even though I know you're over 21, I'm not comfortable with you drinking beer in the house, you know, or bringing a whole group of friends over for a party. I mean, you just really have to let them know and they'll respect it you know they won't get upset because you talk to them up front so yeah, and her I, think you. Said it, I think what you said is right there is, is the communication being mm -hmm. really crystal clear about what your expectations are right and we're actually um, running out of time we, we okay. this time really did like go wee <laughs> versus <laughs> <laughs> so okay so really quickly, what is okay. the third book? This third book is called How to Start a Business and Be Your Own Boss. And with this particular book, I've had people since I've had my nonprofit the last few years, they've always asked me, well, um, how did you start your business? So this one, I'm debunking some of the myths. For instance, have professional business cards, have a professional website. Um, make yourself accessible because people want to feel like you're credible, you're legitimate, they can contact you, they don't have to search you out. You know, you're not some big mystery which often translates into scam. So you want to make sure that you have a professional um, uh, demeanor and, and way about you and your business. I talk about building relationships with people, using your social media which is how I found Carly and Fred. So, you know, use LinkedIn. It's a professional network, you know, and, and try to use Twitter and get familiar with Instagram and all of these things out there. But also follow other people. Don't just expect people to just follow behind you uh, because the world does not revolve solely around you and your business. It's, it really is networking and give and take. Um, so in here, there are several different things the aspects of starting a business and there are there's room for people to actually write out a plan so there are questions that guide you through the process of starting your business and getting you to think like a CEO because when you have your own business that's really what you are you may not feel like it 
or you may not be getting the CEO salary that you love at, at first, but you know, uh, you are the CEO, the buck stops with you, and the decisions start with you. So that's the third group. Um, anyways, um, everyone, just like right now, I will be putting together an entire blog which will have the embedded video, embedded podcast with all of our links, all of our information so you can find out lots more. Um, also, since this is a podcast, please let everyone know where they can find you. Um, they can find me at education for that's the F O U R A L L dot com. So the website it has everything on there. They can also um, find me on Twitter. My Twitter and my LinkedIn are also listed on the website educationforall.com. Perfect. It's been such a joy to have you. Thank you so much for joining me once again. I'm sure you have plenty of conversations because you have so much wonderful information. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with me. I really and appreciate, I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Anyways, you have been with your host, Carlissa Thorne, and you can find me at carlylissathorne.com. That's C-A-R-L-Y-A-L-Y-S-S-A-T-H-O-R-N-E.com. I look forward to being with everyone next week and bringing you more valuable information. I wish everyone a wonderful evening, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Enjoy, everyone. Bye for now.